Brothers and sisters, peace be with you. Praise the Lord! It's time to read the Bible again. We will continue with John chapter ten. Today we will study verse twenty-two to thirty. Verse twenty-two. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. Here John gave us the time. The first half of John chapter ten documented what happened on the Sabbath after the Feast of Tabernacles. The conversations between Jews, Jesus, and the Jews after Jesus healed a man born blind at birth. The Feast of Tabernacles happens in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, which is around September or October of the solar calendar. The Feast of Dedication, also known as the Hanukkah, is a Jewish festival of lights. Happens in the ninth month of Jewish calendar, which is around December, according to the solar calendar. The Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Dedication are a little more than two months apart. The Feast of Dedication originated in the Greek Empire. After Alexander the Great, the territory of Greece broke into four parts. Palestine was under Syria's jurisdiction when Syria was under Antiochus. The fourth, aka Antiochus Epiphanes, who strictly executed Hellenization, between 167 and 164 A.D., he stopped Jewish worship. He also set up the idol of Jews in the Holy Temple for the Jews to worship. He also desecrated the altar with pig's blood. This period is the darkest moment of the Jewish history. Last year, when we studied the Book of Daniel, we talked about the history of this period in Daniel chapter eleven, verse twenty-eight to thirty-five. You may choose to review it on your own. Daniel chapter eleven, verse thirty-one: His armed forces will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination, which causes desolation. He will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. These scriptures refer to Antiochus Epiphanes and what he had done to the holy temple. It was then God rose his temple to who firmly resisted Antiochus Epiphanes. The most important among them was the family of Maccabeus. Judah Maccabeus led the Jews to defeat Antiochus Epiphanes by using the guerrilla tactics. In a hundred sixty-four A.D., in the ninth month of the Jewish calendar, they restored the worship in the temple. This is the origin of the Feast of Dedication, which is different from the other three major Jewish festivals. Through Moses, God gave the Jews the other three major holidays or festivals: the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. On the Feast of Dedication, every household in Jerusalem celebrates by lighting up the city of Jerusalem for eight days. Therefore, the name, the Festival of Lights. Yet the lights could not eradicate the dark side of the Jews. Or illuminate the dark side of the Jews. John chose to to record what happened during the Feast of Dedication here to emphasize the messages given by Jesus when he went to Jerusalem about two months ago, during the Feast of Tabernacles. There and then, Jesus openly invited everyone who was thirsty to go to him. And moreover, whoever believed in him would have rivers of life flowing out from them. Jesus' main message was recorded in John chapter eight, verse twelve. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of the life. In John chapter nine, verse five to seven, Jesus announced that while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. There and then, Jesus used a very special way to heal the man born blind at birth. The person born and walked in the darkness up to this moment of his life finally received the light of life. Jesus came to be the light of the world, as different from the lights lit up during the festival of lights. Jesus allows men to gain life from within themselves, and this life within men becomes the light of life. This light of life allows the blind to see. Under this background, in verse twenty-three, 
and Jesus was in the temple area walking in the Solomon's colonnade. Solomon's colonnade was in the outer court, and there are different cloisters enclosing the outer court. The cloister on the east side of the court is called Solomon's colonnade. While Jesus was walking there, perhaps there were some people stopped for Jesus' teaching. Verse twenty four. The Jews gathered around him, saying, "How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly." The Jews were always uncertain about Jesus' identity. On the one hand, Jesus indeed performed many miraculous signs that had to come from God; otherwise, no one could do it. Jesus also proclaimed that he was sent by God. But、on the other hand, Jesus violated the laws announced by the Pharisees. So, for the Pharisees, Jesus obviously was a sinner. Yet, questions and disagreement about Jesus' identity arose. The Jews thus became hesitant, so they came to Jesus and said to him, "If you are the Christ, tell us plainly." The Pharisees were familiar with the Old Testament. The prophets in the Old Testament repeatedly prophesied the coming of the Messiah. In their understanding, based on their religious traditions, the Jews knew Messiah was to come to restore the glory of Israel. Especially at that time, the Jews were ruled under Roman Empire. They indeed hoped for the coming of the Messiah to rescue them from the reign of the Roman Empire. This understanding of the Messiah was incomplete. In fact, Jesus Christ will come twice. The first time Jesus Christ came, he came as the Lamb of Redemption. He did come for judgment. He didn't come for judgment. I'm sorry. Therefore, the restoration of the glory of Israel was not the focus of Jesus' ministry when he came the first time. In verse twenty-five. To their question, Jesus answered, "I did tell you, but you do not believe." When did Jesus tell the Jews that he was the Messiah? Surprisingly, Jesus did not openly tell the Jews that he is the Messiah who is to come. The Gospel of John recorded at least two times when Jesus admitted that he was the Messiah to come in private conversations. In private conversations, the first time was in John chapter four, verse twenty-six. In the conversation with the Samaritan woman about the worship, John chapter four, verse twenty-five to verse twenty-six, the woman said, "I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us." Then Jesus declared, "I who speak to you am he." He. Therefore, Jesus admitted that he was the Messiah. At the time, there were only Jesus and the Samaritan woman. The second time was recorded in John chapter nine, verse thirty-seven. After Jesus healed the blind man and the blind man was casted out from the synagogue, Jesus went to look for the man. In verse thirty-six, "Who is he, sir?" the man asked. Tell me so I may believe in him. In John chapter nine verse thirty-seven, Jesus said, "You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you." It's noteworthy that Jesus admitted that he is the Messiah in private settings in order to help others accept salvation by admitting himself as the Messiah. Of course, we are familiar with the fact that Jesus' disciples knew Jesus as the Messiah, recorded in Matthew chapter sixteen, verse sixteen. When Jesus brought the disciples to Caesarea Philippi, there Jesus asked the disciples, "Who do you say I am?" After receiving the Father's revelation, what Simon Peter answered, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." After the Father revealed to Peter, and Peter made the declaration, Jesus not only admitted himself as the Messiah; he continued to say in Matthew chapter sixteen, verse eighteen, "And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church." Let's return to John chapter ten, verse twenty-five. When Jesus said, "I did tell you." We know Jesus' way of telling the Jews that he is the Christ is not what the Jews were expecting. 
clearly and openly admitted in public to the crowd that he is the Messiah. Jesus continued to say in verse 25, The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. Although Jesus did did not openly testify himself to the crowd as the Messiah, Jesus did do many things. From the things Jesus did, we can tell that he is the Messiah because the things he did could testify for him. Then we have one question. Why didn't Jesus clearly tell the Jews that he is the Christ? Instead, Jesus asked the Jews to recognize him as Christ from the things that he had done. Here we are talking about the essence of Christianity, which is based on the foundation of revelation. Only through one's faith, one can see the revelation from God. For those who are willing to believe, to pursue, take the Samaritan woman for an example. Jesus first touched her conscience, then talked about worshiping. Because of her seeking heart, Jesus assuredly told the Samaritan woman that he is the Messiah. As to the blind man by birth, because the blind man admitted that Jesus was sent by God and was thrown out of the synagogue by the Pharisees, it was only after that Jesus revealed to him that he is the Son of God. That is to say, for every pursuer, he or she has to pay a price on the journey of faith. Then he or she will be able to see what Jesus, that Jesus is Christ, who is the Son of God. For those who are unwilling to believe, Jesus rather for those people to know him through the things that he did. If you don't have a willing heart, then you won't be able to see that Jesus is Christ. Therefore, Jesus continued to say in verse 26, But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. We know in John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know it very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life, whether you are the Lord's sheep is determined by whether you have eternal life or not. Once you believe and are willing to accept, you are the Lord's sheep. If you are unwilling to believe and you don't accept, then naturally you are not the Lord's sheep. In verse 27, Jesus continued to say, My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. This verse tells us that once you become the Lord's sheep, you must have a close relationship with the Lord Jesus. The shepherd will call the name of the sheep. The sheep will hear the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd knows every sheep, and the sheep follows the shepherd. Every Christian must establish relationships directly with the Lord Jesus Christ so we may know him more and more and follow him more and more. Then Jesus added in verse 28, I gave them eternal life and they shall, not, they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. What Jesus said here is very similar to John chapter 3 verse 16 because once you believe, we all receive eternal life from the Lord. Once we have eternal life, we will not perish because, of, because the life of God transcends time which is incorruptible and everlasting. Here, Jesus continued to say, No one can snatch them out of my hand, because Jesus is a good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and thus we are saved. Therefore, Jesus' hand is the hand that saves. In addition to being a good shepherd, Jesus is is the great shepherd who leads us through the lifelong journey of faith. Throughout our life, inevitably, we face some challenges and we stumble, but Jesus will always save us with his hand. He saves us and he keeps us that no one can snatch us from his hand, so our salvation is secure and certain. Next, in verse 29, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Here, Jesus further talked about his relationship with the sheep. This relationship does not only exist between the shepherd and the sheep, even God the Father is involved, because every sheep is is given by God to Christ. God the Father is greater than all. All were created in his will. 
Of course, he is greater than all, so no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. The Father's hand is the hand that chooses, just like in Ephesians chapter one, verse four, tell us. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Before the world was even created, the Father already chose us to be holy and blameless. Because the Father already chosen us, and He's greater than all, therefore no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. Dear brothers and sisters, have you ever considered the indisputability and certainty of your salvation as unquestionable? It is not because we're good, not because we obey, not because we submit, but because we have two hands. One is the hand of Jesus, the hand that saves us, and the second hand is the hand of the Father, the hand that chooses us. These two hands tightly hold on to us, that no one can snatch us away. If you find yourself doubting your salvation after you're saved, these two passages are the best guarantee of your salvation. Let us also use this opportunity to discuss the frequently asked question. Which is about the concept once saved, always saved, or perseverance of the saints.、Um, this concept has been debated by different theological perception over the past hundreds of years. In fact, this is a misconception because a person's salvation is not a point in time, but a process over time. When you say once saved. But if you cannot define at what point of your life you're saved, then whether you are always saved cannot be defined. What we are more certain is that once you have the eternal life, you will never lose it. You will always have it. John chapter ten verse twenty eight and twenty nine tell us that we have Jesus' hand that saves us and keeps us, and we also have the Father's hand that defines and chooses us. Who can take us away from their hands? Yet by believing, we have eternal life in us. This is a life within us that cannot be seen or determined by others. Whoever asks questions about once saved, always saved, as someone who, based on external qualifications, wants to decide whether others lose salvation or not. For example, when I said the sinner's prayer, then I was once saved, always saved. Or when I get baptized, then was I once saved, always saved? We cannot decide whether a person is safe or not, based on the, on the external qualifications. Someone can say the sinner's prayer, but he or she does not believe, and therefore he or she does not have eternal life. Someone can be baptized in formality, but he or she does not believe, then therefore he or she does not have eternal life. But one thing is for sure: you yourself should know if you truly believe and experience the salvation of Jesus Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit writ dwelling in you. If you are certain about the above said, then you can be confident in saying that you will never lose this eternal life because the Father had chosen you, and Jesus Christ had already saved you. Verse thirty. I and the Father are one. Jesus Christ came to Earth, and whatever He did on Earth was in accordance with the Father's will. He was one with the Father completely. It is unquestionable that whoever the Father had chosen, Jesus Christ saved. Let us pray together, dear Lord. Thank you for being our shepherd. We are your sheep, and we listen to your voice, and we follow you. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, which is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. You also promised us that no one can snatch us from the hands of yours and the Father's. How assuring! May you help us not only understand in our head knowledge that your salvation is solid and certain, but also allow us to experience your faithfulness and your mightiness. Bless my life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.